This will be the review on trust for my Wills, Trust, and Estates class. When you recreate a valid express trust, there's four things you'll have to look at. First, did the settler intend to create the trust? Did the settler fund the trust? Does the trust have ascertainable beneficiaries? And it's not always, but sometimes a trust must be in writing. What's going to trigger this writing requirement is whether the trust is testamentary, that meaning that it's actually in a will, or that the trust will hold real estate. With regards to intent, the intent to make a gift under a trust must be clear. The terms must be clear that the property is going to be used for the benefit of the beneficiaries. If you recall, there were some cases we looked at where you had this kind of wishy-washy language where it was, I wish the property be used for you know, my children, or I hope that the property is used for. That wish or hope type language isn't good enough. It's got to be very express that this property will be used for the benefit of XYZ. Additionally, the seller must also have testamentary capacity. In order to understand what that is, if you'll go back to the wills deck of slides, at the very beginning, we cover testamentary capacity. The requirement of ascertainable beneficiaries. The easiest example of an ascertainable beneficiary is where you list specific names of people or a class of people that's easy to determine. Such a class would be my issue, my children, if children has been properly defined within the trust, my siblings. You get the idea. That's the easy one. An example was brought up during class where it was my Facebook friends. Well, if your friends are on Facebook when you die, we can go ascertain who those friends are. We have a list. But remember when we looked at the Marilyn Monroe testamentary instruments, and in it, she had this very broad language, friends, things of that nature, but there was no list of these friends. How are we going to define who these friends are? Those would not be ascertainable. Now, historically, you had to be a human to be ascertainable. However, in order to allow pet and cemetery trust, and those are the trust set up so that you can care for pets after your de demise, or a cemetery trust is set up to take care of a cemetery. So usually it's a plot, like my plot, my family plot, something like that. In order for those to survive, courts have historically just transferred them into honorary trust and kept them alive that way. The trustee's powers. Traditionally, they have to be expressly stated in the trust. If they're not listed in the trust, then the trustee doesn't have the power to do it. These days, they are statutes that will enumerate what a trustee can do. Remember that a trustee actually holds the legal title to the property and therefore must manage the assets, while the beneficiaries only hold equitable title. The trustee has six basic duties. That's the duty of loyalty, the duty of prudence or care, the duty to take proper care, the duty of impartiality, the duty to inform an account, and the duty to make distributions. Loyalty is an often tested subject, and it looks to everything being done in the best interest of the beneficiaries. Just like in family law where you have best interest of the child, in trust law you have the best interest of the beneficiaries. It requires that the trustee act reasonably and in good faith, that there be no self-dealing, and that the trustee avoid conflicts of interest. Now, if there is a self-dealing or conflict of interest 
situation which arises, or anything else under the duty of loyalty, there's a few workarounds that are possible. You can get a court order authorizing the trustee to engage in this conduct. The trust terms themselves might allow for it, or all beneficiaries may consent. An example of this was a case we saw during the course where the trustee had to figure out what to do with this farmland. He was the current lessor. So he's, he's on the land, he's farming it. He becomes the trustee immediately before planting season or seed, you know, when you have to seed and doesn't have time to go out in the market and find another farmer to take over. So he's in that position where either he could not farm the land and really not maintain the, the trust or go ahead and farm it. And that's what he chose to do. In hindsight, he could have gone and got a court order authorizing this or got the consent of all the beneficiaries. He didn't do any of that. The cause of action is brought for self-dealing. Even though he paid market rate for the rent on the land, and it produced a profit, he was deemed to be in breach of that self-dealing. Self-dealing doesn't matter. It's If you've done well with the assets and made money, that's still self-dealing, even if it was for the trust. It's a very harsh situation, but that's how it is. They want to definitely not have self-dealing going on. The duty of prudence. This is that duty that we discuss normally when talking about fiduciary duties. It's a situation where you have to take care of somebody else's property. And as a fiduciary, you're going to do it to the same level you would if it, the property were actually yours. In this case, the trustee is charged with administering the trust with the skill and care of a person of ordinary prudence and that that person of ordinary prudence would engage in when dealing with their own affairs. Additionally, the trustee has the duty to obey the settler's intent. Hopefully this intent is expressly stated in the, in the trust document, but if it's not, and you can determine what that intent was from the terms in the trust, the trustee will have to follow that. And it's under the duty of prudence that we find that duty to make the trust assets productive. In these days, we follow, in most states, the Uniform Prudent Investment Act. The Uniform Prudent Investment Act looks at the whole investment scheme to determine if it's good or not up to par. This will include diversification and the common investment modeling and investment management techniques used these days. Prior to this, what was used was a prudent man Investment Act, and under that, they were looking at the performance of each individual investment. So even though you'd have some investments that did fantastic, if other ones didn't do so well, you'd run into problems. The Uniform Prudent Investment Act takes care of that as you're looking at the whole portfolio. The duty to take proper care. This just means that the trustee has to take proper care of the trust property. The trustee has to collect and protect that property, earmark the property, not commingle it, assert trust rights if there's a cause of action that can be brought, also has to defend the trust against actions, keep good records, and segregate trust property from other property. This makes sense. Impartiality. The trustee has to be loyal to all the beneficiaries, the current and the remainder. One way this is done is proper principal and income allocation. 
Now, if you recall, you've got a principal account and an income account. And the principal account will hold the assets and the income account will hold whatever income is being generated from that principal. Well, in order to meet this duty of impartiality, it is possible, depending on the trust and how profitable it's been, and what assets are actually held, to have some of that income be recharacterized into principal. Now, you might wonder when you would see this. Not necessarily so much when you have stocks and bonds, but if you've got mineral interests, like an oil trust or an oil asset in there, and the oil lease doesn't have a really large value, but it generates a ton of income. The other side of that oil interest is as that income is coming out, that oil is being extracted, there's less of it in the ground. So that lease interest or that mineral interest is losing value. Knowing that the remainder beneficiaries will not get a hold of any of the assets until they become current beneficiaries and the current beneficiaries are the ones that, who may be entitled to that income. In order to ensure that the remainder beneficiaries actually have something down the line, part of those receipts from the oil that's been produced and sold off and turned into income may be reapportioned into the principal side of the ledger. Another method that can be used is a unit trust. When a unit trust goes into being, the principal and income become somewhat uh, less important because you're going to look at the complete amount of the trust, the principal, and take a percentage of that principal and pay it out every year to the income beneficiaries. And as you can probably figure out as time goes on, uh, that percentage takes less and less out of the trust because there's less and less money there. Usually, not always, usually. And at some point, that trust is going to exhaust. Now, remedies. If you have a breach of duty, there's a few remedies out there you might want to be aware of just to jot down in case it shows up on the final or a bar exam. And a lot of these, if you had an issue, just a mental uh, block, you could probably come up with a few of them just based on your common sense. For example, if a trust asset's not properly cared for or is sold for too little, the trustee is personally liable for those damages. And throughout trust law, the trustee is always in a position to become personal liable, personally liable for a lot of things, especially the breach of duties, because those are duties of the trustee. But in this scenario, the trustee may be liable for the difference in price, that being the market price less the sales price, if it was sold for too little, and also appreciation damages. And what the appreciation damages take into account is the fact that this asset was improperly sold or possibly sold for too little, and had it remained in the trust, it would have kept appreciating and gaining value. Knowing that, in that scenario, the asset value as of the day of the course decree is taken and you subtract what the sales price was at the time of sale and that makes up your appreciation damages. If you have a self-dealing case, remember we talked about the farmer earlier, he may have to reimburse the trustee fee. Because remember, trustees tend to get paid fees for their administration. The trustee may be liable for any loss sustained may be liable for uh, any gain that was made and have to take that gain and transfer it back to the trust and may have to undo the transaction if it's such a transaction that may be undone. For an example of the appreciation damages, look back to the case where you had the artist who had passed away, named three trustees. Actually, I believe there was four trustees. Um, Two of them were very involved in the art market. One was an artist. One was an art dealer who had sold most of this artist's work. The third trustee involved just kind of went along with it. Didn't really raise his hand, stop anything. The fourth trustee is the one who brought the case because it was a descendant of the, of the artist. And what the court saw was there was 
definitely not only self-dealing, they were violating duties across the board. And in order to make the estate whole, they looked at appreciation damages and stuff because there was a sale of art of this famous artist that possibly was too low and his work had only appreciated from the time of the sale to the time of the court decree. Now, generally, if you've got an issue with trust, since we're already talking about remedies, I'll throw this in here. This can result in a constructive trust or a resulting trust. The reason you'll have a constructive trust, and we see this with wills as well, is to prevent unjust enrichment. So if someone's been engaged in, remember in wills, you had your undue influence, things of that nature, that's a perfect example of a constructive trust scenario. The, the, what a constructive trust does is the court will apply constructive trust on the party who's engaged in the wrongdoing, and that constructive trust is established to pass those assets to the party who's been injured or the one entitled to the party, which would be the one who was injured. Resulting trust, if a trust fails, a court may order the property to transfer back to the settler or the settler's estate. That makes sense, right? Especially if a trust was set up for uh, to pass property to avoid probate. Well, this is a scenario where it'll end up back in the settler's estate and if the settler didn't have a will outside of the trust, then you may have some issues in intestacy. Spendthrift clauses. These clauses get inserted into trust. They're not always there, but they do show up. And the point of these is to protect those beneficiaries who just aren't good with money. And the point of a spendthrift trust is to limit what creditors can reach the assets of the trust. The only creditors at this point who can normally get to those assets are the children who owe child support of the beneficiary, spousal support for former spouses of the beneficiary, taxes owed by the former beneficiary, and any creditor who is owed money for providing necessities. Those four categories shouldn't surprise anybody. Um, there is some talk about allowing tort victims possibly to, to get to the uh, trust assets. But at this time, just work on those four. Those are the ones that we know are out there. Transferability and modification. Trust can be modified if the settler and beneficiaries consent or the trustee and beneficiaries consent. Remember how we talked about this? Getting consent is always a good way to go, regardless of what you're trying to do with the trust. If you can get everybody to agree in writing, then you can go a very long way in getting what you need to get done, done. It makes the court feel better. It's a, you know, just a lot easier if everybody's on the same page. Now, if the beneficiary, if all the beneficiaries consent to the modification, but the trustee declines, says, I'm not doing it, then there's a few cases where the trustee can be overruled. For example, in the, the Claflin Doctrine, which is the traditional doctrine, shows that if the trust has no unfulfilled material purpose, then they may terminate. So in other words, if the trust has met its objectives, you can terminate it or modify it. The modern trend is more broad. It shows if, there, if good cause can be shown, and that's going to be a case-by-case -case basis, or it's in the beneficiary's best interest, or there's been changed circumstances to defeat the settler's intent, then you can terminate or modify. A really good example that kind of captures all three of the modern trend would be if you had a child who ended up developing a some kind of terrible mental illness or got involved in a tragic accident and really needed a lot of help. And the trust was set up with very limiting language that wouldn't get him that help 
or help him maintain a, a lifestyle with those disabilities or injuries he may be suffering, then a court can be petitioned, and that would be a scenario where it can show good cause, that's in the beneficiary's best interest, and that circumstances have changed. Because when the settler set up the trust, he or she likely did not intend uh, to leave such an injured child or, or a mentally injured child out in the cold. Charitable trust can be covered very quickly. They don't require ascertainable beneficiaries, only a charitable purpose. Charitable purposes are what you would think they would be, poverty, education, religion, health, government purposes, or anything else that benefits the community at large. Now, if you have a charitable trust and it is pointed at a specific group or a specific cause, and that cause becomes impossible, impractical, or illegal, then the court will allow the modification of the trust purpose to benefit another particular charitable purpose. Since a charitable trust doesn't have these ascertainable beneficiaries and, and a lot of people involved, it's, it's a charity and uh, whoever the trustee is normally, and to, in order to enforce these, the state attorney general has the duty to supervise in most states. So if a trust is being mismanaged, then the state attorney general can step in and take over and manage the trust itself. Other ways that enforcement actions may be brought is from those with a special interest in the trust, and the settler can bring one as well to overcome any kind of misconduct that's being done by the trustee. Powers of appointment, you just want to remember that there's two. The book calls it general and non-general. A lot of people call the non-general specific. The general, the, the way you tell the difference is a general power of appointment can appoint to essentially anybody. And to get specific, when we say anybody, that includes the donee, the person who holds the power, that person's estate, that person's creditors, or the creditors of, the, of that person's estate. Now, a specific power of appointment cannot be made to the donee, that being the person holding the power, his estate, his creditors, or his estate's creditors, but it can go anywhere else. Remember that with the specific power of appointment, it's not treated as part of the donee's estate for estate tax purposes. That's big. Well, with the general, since it can transfer to the donee or the donee's estate or the creditors, that makes sense that such an interest would fall into uh, that donee's estate for determining estate taxes. Now, if you're going to exercise the power of appointment and it's testamentary, then you're going to have to, in your will, expressly mention that power of appointment. And when you do that, you want to mention what document it comes from. So it would be from Ed's trust. And if you'll be real specific, Ed's trust dated and you, you give the date. But it's going to have to be that specific to overcome objections in every jurisdiction. That clause will also have to say that you're exercising that power. And if you run into a residuary clause, that does kind of do a pass-by statement of in any power of appointment that may not be good enough. It all depends what state you're in. The other thing to remember is some states apply their anti-lab statutes to trusts. California is not one of them.